موضوع درس هذا اليوم المبارك السعيد آفة الكبر في مظاهرها الحديثة انطلاقا من قوله تعالى وإذ قلنا للملائكة سجدوا لآدم فسجدوا إلا إبليس أبى واستكبر وكان من الكافرين الآية In the name of God the Most Gracious, Most Merciful, may God bless our Prophet Muhammad, his household, and his kind and generous companions. Mawlaya, Commander of the Faithful, I am honored by your kind invitation to participate in this royal academic and spiritual forum, the Forum of Ad-Durus al Hasaniyah. May God reward your blessed father who founded it, and may he increase your rewards for continuing to sponsor it. As to my humble person, I am not in fact a guest in this noble kingdom, for although I am an American citizen and the daughter of a Lebanese family, my ancestors up to the 19th century lived in the eastern region of Morocco, in the city of Ahfir, before they migrated to Lebanon. I was brought up with the understanding that whatever place a Moroccan migrates to, and regardless of the passage of time, she remains Moroccan in spirit, true to this culture and proud of its history and civilization. Mawlai, Commander of the Faithful, we would like to make at the beginning of this lesson four important and necessary observations. The first observation is that arrogance in its modern manifestations, which is the topic of this lesson, is the will to rise above others on this earth, which is a forbidden evil because it prevents an individual or a group of people from listening to and following the guidance of Quranic verses. These verses place the human being in his or her rightful place on earth, making him or her feel humble before God's glory. The political dimension to humility before God manifests itself as the lack of corruption and the determination to give each person his or her due. The second observation is that when people hear about this moral concept, that is arrogance, they think of it as an obsolete concept irrelevant to the modern world. They think of it as an outdated religious concept due to their narrow understanding. They imagine that it doesn't affect political life. However, when we Muslims read the Qur'an, our source of guidance, we understand various aspects of life in light of Qur'anic concepts, which we consider to be universal and timeless. Thus, we find the concept of arrogance mentioned in the Qur'an dozens of times, not only as an individual attribute, but as a collective one that influences political life. Its primary victims are the oppressed, that is, those ordinary people under the rule of the tyrannical system of the pharaoh and others like it. Therefore, we should investigate as to who are the arrogant people on earth today and whose arrogance has left its mark on global politics in various degrees and numerous ways. For this reason, we say that modern political arrogance has new forms or manifestations. The third observation is that listening to Quranic verses that distance us from arrogance is not sufficient. It must be accompanied by continuous dhikr, remembrance of the requirements of our relationship with God. This dhikr is what is referred to as consciousness and awareness in today's language. For example, we hear the Mu'addin, the one who calls to prayer, stating five times a day, Allahu Akbar. We understand this as a mere call to prayer. We rarely understand it as an invitation to comprehend the truth of this statement. The truth of Allahu Akbar requires understanding that the reality of the human being, who is given dignity by God and was made his vicegerent on earth, goes hand in hand with the requirements of modest conduct and understanding that we may not act as if we are endowed with divine power and supremacy.
The fourth observation is that based upon the prior observations, we are required to diagnose the state of the world today in terms of the political dimension of the concept of arrogance. We must identify the arrogance of the strong towards the weak and the arrogance of the vulnerable towards those more vulnerable than them. This diagnosis will help us correct our understanding of ourselves and of others because there is already an overwhelming confusion in this understanding. It is one of the reasons for our mistakes and our inability to address many of the predicaments in which we found ourselves. After these observations, we shall begin the lesson starting out from God's verse, and behold, we said to the angels, bow down to Adam, and they bowed down, except Iblis, he refused and was haughty, he was one of those who reject faith. This presentation will be divided into three parts. The first part is on the danger of arrogance, reasons why it was forbidden and ways of eradicating it. The second part is on the negative effects arrogance has on civilizations and the benefits of communication. The third part will focus on the state of the Islamic world in a new information age that has upset traditional equations and put us before challenges requiring sharp thinking that takes into account Quranic warnings against arrogance and Quranic instruction to communicate with the other while preserving our own values. The first part. Our Ummah faces great challenges. It's easy for many of us to blame this fact on political and international reasons out of our control. However, it's high time we face the truths that will help us surmount these problems. And this verse provides us with one of the most important ways to do so. Taking a serious and critical introspective look, we realize that some of the moral vices the Qur'an warned us against have spread among our communities and have contributed to the breakdown of our societies and the lagging of our civilization. These vices have made us vulnerable to gusty winds that are trying to uproot us. These vices are very important, and the first among them is arrogance that has manifested itself in modern ways. The basic principle in our religion is Tawheed. God is one and only, and He is the source of everything in the universe. His will is supreme. Among the Quranic stories rich with lessons on Tawheed is the story of Iblis when God ordered him and the angels to bow down to Adam. The angels bowed to Adam, but Iblis refused and was arrogant, so he was one of the disbelievers. Imam al-Razi says that Iblis's refusal was of his own free will and choice and due to his arrogance towards Adam. This required branding him with kufr. The Qur'an makes clear the logic that led Iblis to kufr when it recounts Iblis's explanation of his decision in another verse. I am better than him. You created me from fire and him from clay. God breathed into Adam of his own spirit, but Iblis ignored Adam's spiritual aspect and limited his comparison to material aspects. This caused Iblis to use the wrong analogy between him and Adam, and hence ended up with the wrong conclusion. Iblis then devised a hierarchy in which the element of which he was created, fire, was superior to that of Adam, clay. This hierarchy doesn't have an objective basis. It is merely an expression of Iblis's will to be arrogant towards Adam. Iblis clung to his subjective view and preferred disobeying God to abandoning it. As for Adam, his disobedience was a result of forgetfulness and lack of resolve. God forgave him, for indeed God does not forgive shirk, but he forgives anything less than that to whomever he pleases. Iblis asked God to give him respite till the day of judgment so he can lure humankind with his logic and tools. 
Imam al-Ghazali, in his Ihya' Uloom al-Din, warned Muslims of the repercussions of Iblisi logic because arrogance towards humankind leads to arrogance towards God's will. Al-Ghazali gave many examples of arrogance towards humankind. Arrogance based on knowledge, money, and power. Al-Ghazali commented about all these forms. He who is arrogant towards one of God's servants competes with God in his divine right over his creatures. This means that each one of us is continuously subject to Iblisi temptations that blind one towards the evil of one's actions and make one stray away from the path of faith and high morals enumerated in the Qur'an. God made all this possible when he gave humankind freedom of conscience and will. Some people use this freedom in the benefit of humanity, while others transgressed. Therefore, the relationship between the individual and God is based on how the individual uses this freedom. This has been the main moral and political dilemma throughout history, especially in this age where people have advanced tools to use their freedom equally for good or evil. Arrogance is the most dangerous of Iblis's traps because it leads to shirk. Imam al-Ghazali says that Prophet Muhammad وسلم, explained arrogance as two vices. He said, disdaining what is true and despising people. Al-Ghazali said that an arrogant person despises people who are God's creatures just like him and may even be better than him. This is the first vice. Second, Imam al-Ghazali said that anyone who thinks he is better than his brother despises him and looks down upon him and knowingly conceals and rejects the truth would have committed the sin of arrogance towards humanity. And whoever refuses to humble himself before God and obey him and his prophets would have committed the sin of arrogance towards God and his prophets. Our people today are plagued by many kinds of transgressions, especially transgression in the name of religion by those who claim to understand it. People disdain each other intellectually and physically. And what disdain is worse than unjustly killing another human being when God has given dignity to all? So we have returned to the pre-Islamic days of Jahiliyyah, but today these people are armed with modern tools of death and destruction. Those who engage in these actions have committed the sin of arrogance towards humankind and are competing with God in his divine right over his creatures. The world in which Adam is God's vicegerent was created with precise accuracy and balance. With it, God revealed the Qur'an which, among many other things, is a roadmap for those who want to use its wisdom and understand God's sunnah in his creation. It is a compass for those who want to reach a safe shore. God said, The sun and the moon follow courses exactly computed, and the stars and trees alike prostrate in adoration. And the firmament has he raised high, and he has set up the balance in order that you do not transgress balance. Transgressing the balance is a great evil, for the heavens and the earth Earth were created justly in due balance. Today we take a stand for truth before God, before ourselves and other nations. We have to admit that the bonds of community and unity within our Ummah are in danger, as is our relationship with other nations and peoples. On the international level, we confuse civilizations with politics and wars. This confusion gave rise to arrogance by some of us towards entire civilizations, branding them as disbelieving and corrupt with no benefit to our people. Others are still reminiscing over the golden age of the Islamic civilization. 
They forget God's words, and such days we alternate among people. Our sciences have weakened, even the religious ones, and our Renaissance efforts lag woefully behind. Therefore, we need to rectify this situation and restore the balance before it's too late. At the forefront of what needs to be rectified is the eradication of the vice of arrogance by returning to the Qur'an and contemplating its verses. Ways to rectify the state of affairs at the international level are clear. We need to apply what God instructed us to do in terms of ta'aruf, getting to know one another, based on God's words. We made you into tribes and peoples so you may know one another. Following this verse leads to a civilizational prosperity that can benefit generations to come, as will be shown in the second part of this lesson. This is actually what happened in the early days of Islam, when Muslims learned from the Greek and Roman civilizations. Despite religious differences between them and frequent military conflict, then they developed their knowledge of both civilizations to produce a global Islamic civilization whose contributions continue to resonate until this day. It is relatively well known that Europe and the rest of the world reaped significant benefits from the Islamic civilization. There is a great deal of research on the benefits Europe reaped from the Islamic civilization, especially through Andalusia. At the peak of its civilizational prosperity, Andalusia was an extension of the political and civilizational state of affairs in Morocco. The United States of America is the leading Western country today. Yet, not much is known about the relationship between the Islamic and American civilizations, especially with respect to constitutional and legal thought. This is what I will discuss in the second part of this lesson based on my personal research as an American professor of law. The popular mood in 18th century America, which was influenced by distorted Orientalist images of Islam, was suspicious of and unfriendly towards the religion. Yet, that did not stop the Founding Fathers of the United States from seriously discussing Islamic constitutional precedents in their constitutional debates. These debates laid the foundation for the United States Constitution as it exists today. They would not have reached their objective had they not been intellectually modest vis-à-vis -vis the civilizational legacies of other nations. Despite the general mood, which was negative as we mentioned, several founding fathers made serious efforts to educate themselves and learn about Islam and the Islamic civilization. For example, the library of Thomas Jefferson, the third American president, contained at least one copy of the Qur'an and was rich with books about ancient civilizations, including Islamic ones. He appeared to consider his knowledge of these matters important for the development of the American model of political governance. In that approach, he wasn't alone. Other founding fathers shared his perspective. For example, Alexander Hamilton and James Madison evaluated the governmental structures of the Ottoman Empire and Persia while formulating their own positions for a federal system in the United States. Thomas Jefferson was somewhat different. His interest in Islam blossomed early while he was still a student at the College of William and Mary. That interest continued to grow in later years. 
Jefferson owned a copy of what is referred to as Sale's Quran, a two-volume work by the British author George Sale, 1734 AD, that contains history of the Islamic civilization and the translation of the Quran. It provided a more balanced view of Islam and its prophet than other works of that era. There is good reason to believe that if Jefferson owned Sale's Quran as a student, he would have read it. The first volume of the book consisted of the author's exposition and own assessment of the Prophet Muhammad and Islam. In an introductory statement to the reader, Sale countered the general myth that Islam was spread by force. He stated, I shall not here inquire into the reasons why the law of Muhammad has met with so unexampled reception in the world. For they are greatly deceived who imagine it to have been propagated by the sword alone or by what means it came to be embraced by nations which never felt the force of Muhammadan arms. Sale also admired the Prophet and provided a favorable description of his personality and high moral character. One point made in his manuscript is particularly salient in light of Jefferson's writings. Sale states that the Prophet declared that his business was only to preach and admonish, that he had no authority to compel any person to embrace his religion. This point is stated in the Qur'an itself, which is translated in the second volume of Sale's Qur'an in the verse, You are not a controller over them, and the verse, let there be no compulsion in religion. Jefferson expressed a similar point of view in his writings about freedom of belief. He stated, Compulsion in religion is distinguished peculiarly from compulsion in every other thing. I cannot be saved by a worship I disbelieve and abhor. Jefferson drafted the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom, which was the legal precedent for the Freedom of Religion Clause in the American Constitution. One wonders whether this statement was in any way inspired by his readings of Sale's Quran on freedom of religion. Jefferson's views on religions created problems for him. He was called atheist and some considered him an infidel and therefore unworthy to serve in the highest office of the country. This experience no doubt hardened Jefferson's resolve towards guaranteeing freedom of religion for all, he argued. Neither pagan nor Mohammedan nor Jew ought to be excluded from the civil rights of the Commonwealth because of his religion. Clearly, Jefferson was a man who believed in the ta'aruf of civilizations and religions and celebrated religious differences among people by protecting their civil rights as citizens. Furthermore, one important element of the U.S. constitutional structure remained an enigma, namely that of federalism. The federal system of the United States was very unusual in that it had no known precedent. Yet, it shared important ideological and legal similarities with the Charter of Medina. Here, I would like to highlight some of these similarities to encourage future research on this matter and to rebut claims that American democracy as a constitutional concept is foreign to Islam and that it must therefore be rejected. These claims ignore even the concept of bay'ah, as explained by Muslim scholars such as Al-Mawardi and Ibn Khaldun and others. This attitude of arrogance and disdain towards other cultures closes the door on ta'aruf and increases chances of conflict and ill will. 
The Charter of Medina represents the oldest example of federalism. The Charter united various Muslim and non-Muslim tribes of the city-state as a way of forging a new federal community, which was no longer plagued by tribal wars. At the same time, each tribe retained its identity, customs and internal relations. The federal aspect of the Charter appears in matters such as common defense and peacemaking, purposes similar to those in the preamble to the U.S. Constitution, which refers to domestic tranquility and common defense. Over 1400 years ago, in an era when religious intolerance was the rule, the Charter of Medina stated that Jews of the community, who were party to the Charter, were an integral part of that society. They, meaning the Jews of Medina, and Muslims were one people, and to each their own religion. The Charter contained constitutional rights also guaranteed by the U.S. Constitution or in related opinions by the U.S. Supreme Court. Some of the rights mentioned in the Fourth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, such as the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses and effects, <coughs> are also considered basic necessities in Islam. There is a significant similarity between the concepts in the Charter of Medina, executed in the 7th century, and those of the U.S. Constitution, drafted in the 18th century. The Charter and the Constitution deserve further analysis to uncover additional similarities and historical facts. <coughs> Islamic principles might have influenced more than just the U.S. Constitution. <laughs> Professor John Maqdisi studied the origins of the common law, which is the basis of both British and American law. He discovered several common law concepts that may have originated from Islamic legal systems. His discovery also revealed the existence of a very culturally curious and intellectually modest ruler. This ruler was King Roger II of Sicily. Among his entourage was the Moroccan geographer Al-Sharif al-Idrisi al-Sabti, who designed the famous Earth map. King Roger II was impressed by Islam and he respected the Islamic civilization. He also guaranteed Muslims in Sicily their rights, including their freedom of religion. Maqdisi noted that the origins of some contractual principles and the jury system that arose during the reign of King Henry II of England, who is a relative of King Roger II, remain unknown until this day and do not seem to have originated from either civil, Roman or canon law. Yet, these origins may be found in Islamic law and specifically in the Maliki school of thought, such as the concepts of istihqaq and lafif. Maqdisi studied the geographical, familial and political factors that facilitated the possible transfer of the Islamic legal thought from Sicily to England. After that, it would have been easy for these ideas to be transferred to the United States along with other Anglo-Saxon ideas that became part of constitutional amendments and important constitutional rights. The transfer of ideas wouldn't have taken place had King Roger II not adopted a modest and friendly policy towards Muslims. He allowed the Muslims to stay in Sicily and worship freely according to their faith. Thus, 
Sicily knew an era of peace and tolerance that led to the prosperity of that kingdom. Compare this state of affairs with that of Spain. In the 16th century, when Muslims were expelled from Spain, the concepts of ta'aruf and ta'aluf, which means being in friendship and harmony with Muslims, were rejected and replaced with arrogance and oppression. It is clear that everybody lost in Spain because of political short-sightedness that led to the expulsion of Spain's Muslims and Jews. This had dire repercussions extending to the Iberian Peninsula. Arrogant Iblisi logic has had dire consequences throughout history, while Quranic logic resulted in great benefits. This Quranic logic necessitates humility before God's creation and belief that God created all people of the same soul and created differences among them as an opportunity for the mutual understanding and diversity. It is a perplexing paradox that some extremists in our Muslim communities declare enmity to entire civilizations because of principles these civilizations might have originally borrowed from our religion, especially with respect to freedom. At the same time, we also find some in these civilizations who claim superiority by virtue of these these very principles. They accuse us of ignorance and argue that these principles should be forced upon us. Mawlai, commander of the faithful. Muslims are today at the cusp of a new renaissance. That might be accelerated or delayed depending on our choices. This may not be obvious in light of escalating violence and destruction. However, the awakening has started. We now know that our problems are not just external or foreign. The problems are also from within. We can either choose to follow the model of arrogance, hatred and disdain and reject the opportunity of ta'aruf or we can choose the model of tawadu and ta'aruf and seek knowledge wherever we find it, so long as it is consistent with our values. This takes us to the third and last part of this lesson and presents us with real possibilities for answering related questions. The world today is experiencing the third wave or the third technological revolution that is developing so rapidly. It is altering even our usual modes of thinking, our worldview, and how we obtain information. The 21st century is very different from the 20th century. This difference outweighs that between the industrial and the agricultural society. Its changes are faster and its possibilities are greater, as proven by the Internet and social media platforms that have recently played an important role in the stability of some societies and countries. Adam Smith's capitalist invisible hand has been replaced by many other invisible hands that can move large numbers of youth in different parts of the world without even knowing them to take serious and dangerous actions that can change the course of history. At the same time, this wave opened the door to medical treatments and teleworking. So how will we deal with this wave? Before condemning it, we have to understand it and the scope of its capabilities, for it has integrated the entire world with the speed of light. The third wave is knowledge-based. Individuals who are a product of this wave think, work, and understand the world differently than us. This opens a gap among our generations that has deep consequences. In the West, preparation for this new age started in the 60s, but our youth in the Muslim world world moved into the new age without any preparation or education. It was not provided the necessary intellectual armor that would protect it against the manipulation of its thought processes and even its destiny, so it fell into many Iblisi traps that harmed us all. We need to rectify this situation by hastening to learn more about this modern age. We need to understand its nature and capabilities and provide this youth with the proper critical consciousness to handle it in a constructive manner. Being part of the third wave is a necessity for Muslims. Our absence as leaders during this wave and our presence only as consumers will leave us behind in this latest civilizational revolution.
Therefore, we have to take the initiative to use this new wave to the benefit of humanity through a long-term strategy. We still have a large reserve of brain power. Suffice it to point out that a major architect of the new age, Steve Jobs, was the son of an Arab Muslim father. The third wave is not a transitory phase. It is here to stay. It is based on communication and interconnectedness, two characteristics that can be positive if used correctly. Therefore, we need to realize that ta'aruf, especially at this specific time, is our obligation in order not to miss possibilities for the prosperity of our communities and their protection from dangers. Maulai, Commander of the Faithful, Your Majesty is known for your concern for the Ummah and the many initiatives you have taken to rectify this Ummah's state of affairs makes my speech about this topic today, which included some complaints, a permissible and acceptable speech. May you live long and may God effect more reform with your guidance. May peace and blessings be with you. إن الله وملائكته يصلون يا الدرس الخامس من الدروس الحسنية الرمضانية ألقته بين يدي أمين المؤمنين الأساذة عزيز الهبري أساذة القانون في جامعة ريتشموند سابقا تناولت فيه بالدرس والتحليل موضوع آفة الكبر في مظاهرها الحديثة في عهد أمين المؤمنين شهدت الدروس الحسنية تحولا نوعيا تمثل في إشراك المرأة العالمة في هذه المجالس بشانب أخيه الرجل يتقدم للسلام على جلالة الملك الأستاذ قيس بن محمد بن عبد اللطيف آل مبارك تميمي عضو هيئة كبار العلماء في السعودية والأستاذ جلال الدين علوش أستاذ التعليم العالي بجامعة الزيتونة في تونس والأستاذ خالد مذكور عبد الله المذكور رئيس اللجنة الاستشارية العليا للعمل على استكمال تطبيق أحكام الشارع الإسلامية بالكويت والأستاذ عبد العزيز بن صالح العوضي مستشار بمكتب معالي وزير الأوقاف والشؤون الدينية بسلطنة عمان والأستاذ محمد حافظ والسالك عالم وشاعر من أسرة العلويين في موريتانيا والأستاذ الحاج عبد الله جاسي من علماء غينيا والأستاذ محمد كارلو من علماء جنوب إفريقيا والأستاذ أحمد ميان تهانوي فاروقي من علماء باكستان والأستاذ إسماعيل داتسيتش مدير مركز التعليم وتطوير الثقافة الإسلامية إمام وخطيب مسجد عثمان أجيج بمودكو جوسيا في الجبل الأسود والأستاذ مرتضى بوصري أستاذ بجامعة ولاية لاغوس في نيجيريا والأستاذ عبد الرحيم حافظي باحث وصحفي في القناة الثانية الفرنسية ويتشرف وزير الأوقاف والشؤون الإسلامية بأن يقدم لأمير المؤمنين المصحف المحمدي المضبوط بالألوان المأثورة برواية ورش عن نافع إلى هنا سيدتي سادتين وادعكم وإلى اللقاء